meeting is being recorded. Great. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks for joining in on Sunday morning. Uh, I, I know it's tough on Sunday morning, but thanks for joining in. Uh, so this is Rajdeep. I'll be your uh, presenter today. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Revisor. Uh, and today's webinar is going to be about SATs, ACTs, and AP exam. Uh, so what we're going to uh, try to do in today's webinar is we'll be covering each of these exams, but at a very high level view, uh, because we have generally other webinars wherein we deep dive into SATs or ACTs or AP exam. But this time around, uh, the idea here is to cover all the different gamuts of exam. And then if in case you have certain specific questions related to any of these exams, uh, I mean, after about 30, 35 minutes, once the presentation gets over, we will open the forum for Q&A. You can ask the questions there. If you feel that uh, those are personal questions you would like to discuss it later, we'll also be sharing the um, Calendly link where you, wherein you can block a 30 minute uh, free one-on-one -on -one consultation session with us. And we'll be happy to walk you through that presentation as well. So great. with that, let me start with the presentation. So. The, the, the key to takeaways that we are going to discuss today are largely about understanding the standardized tests like SAT, ACTs, and APs. What is the importance of SAT, ACT, and AP for grade 9 to grade 12 students? Uh, how does the timeline look like for SATs, ACTs, and APs with regards to the college application planning? What is the right time to start? Uh, right, And at what stage you should, one should be doing what? Right? What are the countries that accept SATs, ACTs, or AP? Uh, what is the revised recommended timeline and pedagogy uh, that we use to prepare students for these respective tests? And more importantly, uh, if in case, I'm sure you, most of you are already aware, there are a few latest changes which are coming up in SET starting uh, March 2023 onwards for international candidates. So we'll also be uh, quickly looking at those changes and see if, if that's going to affect your prep level as well. Right. Uh, with that, let me start with the first topic. Uh, so let me give you a quick brief about the company here, right? So we are a high school support company which helps students achieve uh, their academic goals. Uh, we largely work with students from grade nine to grade 12. And we have two major segments. The first one is a test prep solution, wherein we help students for SATs, ACTs, and PSAT exam. We also help them with the advanced placement exam, right? And then we also have another vertical, which is in the academic tutoring space wherein we help students with IGCSE, IB, and A-level academic tutoring, right? Uh, and we cover almost about eight to 10 subjects there as well. So that is what we do. So far, we have covered about 3,000 plus students. Uh, we have been in the industry for five plus years. Uh, we've catered to more than six plus countries and about 15 plus cities across India. Now, quickly deep dive into SAT and ACT, what these two exams are, right? So they're standardized tests for undergrad applicants. They're needed by most of the four-year colleges uh, in US. Uh, they help college to determine whether a child is ready for the college prep work or not, right? So they help them uh, understand the readiness or the preparedness level of the child for the college level work. Uh, you could consider them as general aptitude test in verbal and maths or quantitative reasoning. Uh, they're mandatory by most of the US colleges. Uh, obviously over the last two years, the colleges have some of the colleges have gone test blind, which they were earlier as well, nothing new. And some of the colleges have gone test optional because of the pandemic scenario. Uh, I, I would like to clear this point here, right? There is There are two words here. Uh, there is something called test blind, and then there is something called test optional, right? How are these two things different from each other? So when I say test blind, that means even if you submit the scores, colleges are not going to look at your SAT or ACT scores those colleges are known as test blind. Right? And then there are other colleges which go basically, which have gone test optional in the recent pandemic scenario. Test optional means if in case you have done the exam, please submit the score. If you have not done it, you can skip it. However, now since we have the data to kind of showcase, the data says that 80% of the students who actually submit the scores uh, there is a better chance that they will get admission as opposed to the students who have not submitted this course, right? And you know, this test optional thing came into picture, keeping in mind the uh, the developed countries and obviously countries probably poorer than India, wherein, you know, because of the pandemic, the SAT or ACT could not happen. Whereas in India, if you look at it in the last two years, there were only two SAT or the ACT which got canceled and rest all exams happened, right? And hence, Please take that call very, 
cautiously when you're deciding whether you want to write this exam or not maybe discuss it more uh, happy to again discuss it one on one if uh, if in case you guys have any doubt about this test optional and you know test blind thing but yes i would recommend please take that call well ahead of time because you know we get students in or parents whose kids are in grade 12th now and you know they're already very very late initially they thought because colleges are going test optional they don't need to but they realize later on they will have to write the exam right uh, so that's my word of caution here now quickly talking about the difference between two exams right so uh, so sct is conducted by an organization called college board act is conducted by another organization called act.org sct happens five times a year as of today march may august october and december these are standard fixed months uh, wherein the act happens act happens seven times a year feb april june july september october december so act is more often than sat and there's a clear cut reason for it right because sat is a pen and paper test whereas if you look at act it's an online test right so it's lot easier to conduct an online test than to conduct an offline test right so so far as of today act is an offline test you have to go to a particular school and write the exam act on the other hand is an online test however you still have to go to a center and write the exam on their system right so the school or the company where you are writing the exam will provide you the system talking about the duration act is a 3 hour long exam act on the other hand is 3 hours 40 minute long exam and the major difference comes which i'll showcase in the next section right if you look at the sections which are present in these two tests right sat and act so in sat there are four section the first one is a reading which is a reading comprehension wherein you have a total of five passages you are reading the passages and answering the question so you can consider them like a reading comprehension thing right so that is what you have in the reading section uh then you have second section which is the writing section there is nothing that you need to write here it's purely grammar rules so basically they there would be some errors in different passages you need to rectify those errors uh using the four options which are given to you right so that is what is covered in the writing section there are total of 44 questions uh and you have 35 minute to solve this writing section then the third and fourth section are math one is without calculator and another one is with calculator the third section is without calculator wherein you have a total of 20 questions and you have a total of 25 minutes the fourth section is maths with calculator wherein you have a total of 38 questions and you have about 55 minutes to solve these questions these are the four sections that you will see in the sat which accounts for 3 hours of in total time however if you look at the act on the other hand there are four section but there is an optional section as well which is the essay component and hence the exam becomes 3 hours 40 minutes and not 3 hours right let looks let's look at the section here right uh, and it's important to look at this because there's a special word science there and i'll come to that what it is now you see english right so that's the first section in act it is actually equivalent to the writing section of sat so basically you are looking at the grammar i mean you have to basically rectify the grammar rules right you have to look at the read the passage and i mean there would be few errors which are already underlined you have to rectify those errors that is what is covered under the english section the second section that you have is the math section which is with calculator that's another major difference act you have one section without calculator here you are allowed to use the calculator through and through there are total of 60 question and this is for 60 minute so that means you have 1 minute per question whereas if you remember the sat you had almost about 1 and 1/2 minute per question so you had more time in sat as supposed to what you have in act then the third section is the reading section which is similar to the first section of sat which is the reading comprehension section and in this section again you have four passages uh, every every passage will have 10 question you have to read the passage answer the question that is what is covered under the reading comprehension section uh, again if you look at it you have 40 question and you have 35 minutes right that means you have to be really really quick right so it is very time intensive if on the other hand if you look at sat you had 52 question for reading comprehension and you had 65 minutes so you had more than a minute per question whereas in act you have 
40 question and you have 35 minutes. So you have less than minute per question, right? That's the difference between the reading section again. And then the fourth section, which is a very interesting name here, I would say, is the science section in ACT. And, you know, I get a lot of these queries from the parents saying, you know, I am not doing AC. So I generally ask whenever parents call me and ask me about this advice about ACT, uh, that they want to do ACT or ACT. Uh, so I generally ask them, why have you eliminated ACT? So the, you know, the standardized uh, answer that I hear is, you know, my child is not interested in science. And, you know, we are looking at something in business management side or eco side and so on. And hence, you know, we are dropping ACT because ACT, there's a science section, right? And, you know, my answer to that is no. You know, that's the wrong way to look at it. When I say there is a science section in ACT, it's basically reading section. You are reading science-based passages and answering the question. That is what is covered in the, the science section. So please don't go by this name saying science section and the student needs to be good at science to do well in ACT. Not really. You need to be good at reading to do well in the science section. That's pretty much. So that's a major difference. And um, I hope that would help you to take a call whether you should be able to do an SAT or an ACT. Uh, and then there's an optional component, which is an essay component, which used to be there earlier in SAT, which is no longer there now. Uh, and hence the exam is three or 40 minutes. In terms of the scoring, how does it work? So SAT is total of 1600 points. And out of the 1600, it's 800 for English, which is your reading and writing, and 800 for maths. So that's how your score distribution works. Within English also, it's further subdivided between reading and writing, 400 for reading and 400 for writing. That's how the SAT scoring works. On the other hand, in ACT, the scoring is out of 36 points. Each of these sections are scaled out of 36 points. And at the end, the average of the four section is determined, which is also out of 36, right? So that's how the scoring works in the ACT, right? Um, just to give you a high level understanding of these scores, right? How, what are the equivalent scores, right? So 1500 out of 1600 in SAT is a 99th percentile. And 33 out of 36 is in ACT is a 99th percentile, right? So anything above 1500 and 34, 35, 36, these three scores, right? So if I have to put it into bracket, I would say 1500 to 1530 would be 34. 1530 to 1570 would be 35. 1580 to 1600 would be 36. That's the high level score distribution. Then you can obviously go down the lane and you know figure it out for 33, 32, 31. What are the equivalents for SAT as well? But just to give you a high level understanding in terms of how these scaling works, this is how it is. Right? Now, please feel free to uh, keep noting down your question. You can also put it on the chat section while we are on the call and we can take those questions at the end of the webinar again. Now, now let's look at the PSAT, right? What is a PSAT? So PSAT is basically a shortened and a simplified version of SAT, right? So I generally say that, you know, PSAT is a subset of SAT. You have, uh, you, you have basically a shorter version. As the name suggests, right, it's a practice SAT, right? You don't need this for any of your colleges. Please note that, right? No college will ever ask you for your PSAT scores. You're just writing it basically because you want to understand where your child stands at this point of time at, at the international level or among the peers who are writing the piece at, right? And also to figure out what are the areas uh, of strengths, what are the areas of weaknesses where the child has to work on. And based on that, you will be, you know, working on that to improve your SAT score. That's the idea behind writing the piece. At. That's one major reason. Uh, the second reason why people write piece at is also, if in case you're looking to go for summer schools, right? Uh, let's say after grade 10, summer break, you want to go for summer school. Uh, there are a few summer schools which accept PSAT scores as an admission criteria, right? So if that is something that you're looking at, then PSAT could be another test that you might want to look at. Uh, PSAT could be done when you are in grade 8, grade 9, grade 10, grade 11, even for that matter in grade 12. There is no restriction in terms of when you can write the PSAT. However, uh, there's an important point here. I mean, you guys must have heard about NMSQT, right? National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. That is what this stands for. Now, NMSQT is only and only applicable for the students who are US citizens. So if you are a US citizen, if the child is a US citizen, then if you write PSAT in grade 11th, 
then that PSAT score automatically is used for NMSQT, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. If you are not a US citizen, if the child is not a US citizen, then there is no point of even looking at NMSQT because it's not applicable for the child. If the child is a US citizen, then the PSAT only in grade 11th will act for an MSQT score. If you write it in 10th or 9th, it'll be a pure PSAT, right? So please note that point. That's a very important critical point. Uh, now let's quickly look at the differences between the two PSAT and SAT, right? Uh, as I said, right, it's a shorthand version of the SAT itself, nothing else, right? Uh, so you have the same section, you have reading, writing, maths, no cal, uh, maths, cal. Uh, in the reading section of SAT, you had 52 questions, 65 minutes. Here you have 47 questions, 60 minutes. So less number of questions, less time. Writing stays the same. 44 questions, 35 minutes. 44 questions, 35 minutes. Maths, no cal. Time is same. The number of questions are less. 70 questions, 25 minutes. However, SAT has 20 questions, 25 minutes. If you look at math calculator, uh, 31 question, 45 minutes. In SAT, you have 38, 55 minutes. So obviously you have uh, more time in PSAT because you know we are also doing it in grade nine and grade 10. So they also want them to give extra time to do this paper, right? The next line, sorry, this slide is not updated. There are, there are no essays now, whether it's PSAT. PSAT never had essays. Even in SATs, there are no essays now. So you don't have essays in PSAT or SAT either, uh, right? So PSAT is a two hour, 45 minute test where an SAT is a three hour long test. PSAT, the scoring works out of 1520. So your English section is out of 760 points. Your maths is out of 760 points. That's a total of 1520. Whereas on the SAT, as we have already discussed, your English is out of 800 points. Your maths is out of 800 points. Overall is out of 1600 points. Uh, that's how the PSAT and SAT are different in terms of the test perspective. We've already discussed where you can use PSAT, who should write PSAT and why you should write PSAT, right? Let's move on to the next thing, right? The latest changes in SAT, right? And this is a very, very important thing uh, because I know there are a few parents here uh, whose kids are in currently grade nine and moving to grade 10. And, and this change is going to affect them or the kids basically, or your planning per se, right? So the changes which SAT has recently announced uh, almost a week back, uh, there are a few major changes. Obviously there's only one press release which has come out right now. Uh, and we have taken up things from there. The first thing is, <clears throat> and the major change is, the test is going to be online. Just like ACT, SAT is going to be an online test starting March, 2023. So starting next year, March, 2023, SAT is going to be pure online test. They will not be offering offline tests. So both SAT, ACT, the difference about online, offline, which people used to have earlier is no longer there. The SAT is actually reducing the time of the exam to two hours from three hours, which is going to be a huge change because, and that might turn things towards SAT favor because, you know, students lack concentration, right? I mean, they are not able to sit for three hours, focus for three hours. And the moment you reduce the time for the test, you know, it becomes probably more favorable test. Uh, there'll be only two sections instead of four. Uh, that's some news which has come out. We'll have to see how that will pan out. Uh, students will have more time per question. They already had more time if you look at it as compared to ACT. And now they're saying they will have more time than what they had earlier, which is a welcome move. Uh, the test will be online and will be taken on a laptop or tablet. Now here there's a star mark there. You still have to go to a center and do the test. You cannot do the test at home, just like ACT. However, they're allowing you to take your own devices to do the test which is again a very, very welcome move because in ACT, what happened two years back when ACT went off online, there were a lot of challenges which students faced because of all the glitches the system had, the software had. Now they're allowing the students to carry their own laptop. Now the onus lies on the student about the laptop or the tablet where they're doing the exam, right? Uh, if in case uh, somebody is not able to carry it for whatever reason, they will provide the system as well, right? So they are providing that option also. The next is, the testing app would save the student progress while they work. Again, they've learned it from ACT because some of the students lost the time uh, when the system shut down or something happened. Here, the app would automatically save the time the, when the system shut down and will restart from the, where the student would have left, right? By so after solving the technical issue. 
So that's a great welcome move again. Another change, use of calculated throughout the math section. Sorry, it should be section. Uh, so if you had noticed earlier, in SAT, there was a calculator and a no calculator section. In ACT, it was a th through and through calculator section, right? That's a big change again. ACT is saying, we will all, SAT is saying, we will also go all online. We will allow you to use calculator all throughout the math section, which is again a welcome move. The major important point, the test is going to be adaptive. Now that's a new thing, which even ACT has not done, that SAT is going to be an adaptive test. And so far what we are able to understand from uh, the press release is that they are going to have one first section, which is common to all. Based on the performance of this section, the next section will get decided, right? That's what the adaptive nature here would be. It's not question-wise adaptive, it's section-wise adaptive. So based on how you have done in this section, your next section will be dependent on that, right? So this is going to be adaptive, which is going to be very, very interesting. That means technology will have role to play uh, for companies like us. Uh, and then you have obviously important point that the scores will be released much sooner since now, you know, the test is not happening offline. It's happening online. The test will get released much, the results will get released much faster, which was an added advantage for the ACT students. Uh, and now AC, ACT will also have the same advantage. Another point that I would like to add, which is not there in the slide is, ST will also going to increase the frequency. So they're going to be, uh, instead of five times a year, it'll be either six or seven times, they haven't finalized it, but they're gonna also increase the frequency. Again, because now it's going to be online, all the logistics can be reduced. So they are also going to be an online uh, test going forward. So these are the major changes. If you have any question, feel free to put it on the chat and we can take it up and discuss it. Uh, let's move on to the next exam that we talked about, right? Which is advanced placement, AP exams, right? Now. Now this is one of the very unknown territory for most of the parents because uh, the thing is they're not that popular in India. And until last year, they were, I mean, very, very few students used to take it in India. However, starting this year, uh, early March, a lot of people, students have started taking it. The reason is uh, there, there used to be something called subject SATs, if some of you are aware of it, right? There was SAT and then subject SATs. Last year, around this time, SAT announced that they, are, they will not be offering any subject SATs going forward. And because of that, the APs gained more popularity. Right? Now, what are these APs, right? Um, so it basically gives students a chance to tackle the college level course while you are still in your school or in your grade 10th or grade 11th or grade 12th, right? So AP is like another curriculum, right? So for example, some of the students would be in CBSC or ICSC or IB or A level curriculum, right? Now, similarly, AP is a curriculum which is followed in some of the schools, by some of the schools in US. So it's a curriculum in itself. Uh, in India, what you do is you can register for the exams. Obviously you're not doing the course, you, you're doing a self prep. So you're registering as a private candidate and you can write the exam. But the point to note here is the exam happens only once a year which is in the month of May. So that's a very, very important point. It becomes important from the planning perspective, right? Because it's not like ST, ST, which is happening six to eight times a year, uh, five to eight, seven times a year. So, you know, you can, if you miss something, you could always plan it out. AP, it happens only once a year. If you have missed it, you have missed it, right? That's the, that's the reason why AP becomes more important. Uh, then why should one even take it, right? Uh, by the way, the AP happens in the month of May, right? Every year. Uh, the next bigger question that everybody asks, right? Why should I take the AP, right? What's the advantage? Now, you know, there are various reasons why people write APs and let's try and understand those reasons, right? Why one should write it. Uh, so as it says, stand out in college admission. What does this mean, right? So, you know, let's say all your peers have done, uh, you're doing a CBSC curriculum, all your peers have done same PCM, B and two other subjects and you got a 95, 95% in all of that, right? I'm sure, you know, you, you know how many students get 95% nowadays, right? The, the percentage is really, really high. You need a differentiating factor. You need something to showcase that you, have, you know more than what your peers would know, or you are doing, uh, or you have done more than what your peers have done. You are better from them, right? Hence, you do an AP exam. Now, AP happens for different subjects. So you have AP for calculus, statistics, physics, chemistry, bio, uh, economics, computer science, microeconomics, macroeconomics, English. There are almost about 20 plus APs that you can write, right? Or, and, or you can pick at least from those APs, right? 
So stand out in college admission is one of the reason. Second, earn college credits. Now, what is that? If in case you do an AP course, you get credits for it. Right? So for example, if I do an AP calculus course, you will get say about five credits, right? If in case you get a five on five, so AP is scored on a scale of five, five, four, three, two, one. So if you get a five on five, you'll get full credit, which is let's say for example, five credits. That means you don't have to do this course when you land up in US or in the college, right? So that's a bigger advantage of doing an AP that you are getting credits while you are in India itself, right? It's a big plus for CBSC, ICSC or state board, state board students because they don't get any credit for the courses that they're doing. So this is going to be a big uh, booster to your profile and also to help you get credits. When you get credits, obviously you save money, right? Because when you go to US, you're paying for every credit that you're earning, right? So if you have done that while you are in India, you have saved a lot of cost. Uh, then you can skip the introductory classes, right? As I said, if in case you have the right credit, you can skip those classes and maybe take additional classes or maybe keep your workload less while you are early in the college because you, you know, you're right into the college first time away from parents, you want to keep some time extra, you know, to take care of your regular chores and everything, right? So, so that is one of the reasons why some people write it. Uh, build rigor, obviously, because, you know, you're doing more than what your peers have done. So you're building the rigor. You're... Uh, you are building your profile. Uh, you are making sure you are standing out in your college admission. You are able to showcase that you have done more than what your peers have done. So these are all the reasons why people write APs. Now, depending on when they write AP, these reasons could vary, right? If it's a pure credit game, if we are just looking to do this for to save cost, then you know we can easily do it in grade eleventh or even after grade twelfth before you go to college. And we'll talk about it when we come to the timeline, I think probably the next slide itself, right? Uh, however, if we are looking to do this to strengthen our college application, strengthen our profile, then you know you should be doing it after your 10th summer or uh, sorry, ninth summer before going into 10th or uh, before going into 11th, 10th summer or before going into 12th, 11th summer. These are the three time, uh, three sort of years that you kind of get. And you obviously have to be smart enough to plan it out what test a grade nine student can handle and what test a grade 10th or a grade 11 student can handle, what subjects, right? So you'll have to choose your subjects very, very wisely here. That is also an important uh, play in the AP exam. Great, with that, uh, let me move on to the next important thing, which is the testing timeline, right? How does the timeline work? As I said, so you have grade nine, 10th, 11th, 12th. These are the four years that you're talking about. Your profile development is happening all throughout the year, right? You're doing all your uh, social service, uh, you're doing your projects, extracurricular activities, you're doing your MOOC co courses, uh, you're building a resume, you're doing all of that in, in these four years. But in terms of testing, in terms of a standardized testing, how you should be planning it, grade nine, you would do your PSAT prep. Grade 10, uh, you would write your, or you will start preparing for your SAT or the ACT. So you'll write the ST ACT diagnostic test just to understand where you stand, what your levels are and where do you want to reach. And, you know, probably put in that much of a uh, effort towards it. You can start with your ST ACT full training or just English training, depending on which curriculum you are coming from. If you are coming from an IB curriculum or a level IG curriculum, then maybe you can start with the full training. But if you're coming from CBSC and ICSC in grade 10, maybe, just start with English training because you will still have a lot more math content that you have not covered in school, right? And obviously write PSAT if you just want to do it for the sake of practice, right? So that could also happen here. You can also write the APs when you are in grade 10. So, I, I mean, I know a lot of students now who are actually preparing well ahead of time and, you know, planning to write these uh, AP exam in grade 10. So I can also add that column here saying start AP prep or write APs. Then uh, grade 11 is the time wherein you will do your SAT, ACT exams. If you're a US citizen, you'll also write PSAT, which is NMSQT. Uh, you'll prepare for your APs and you'll also write your APs right after grade 11 gets over before your 12 starts. So that's where you will write your AP exam. That happens in grade 11. And then when you move to grade 12, if in case you have to rewrite your SAT or ACT to improve your scores, that is something that you could do early in 12th. Ideally not advisable though. Uh, and then you're obviously working on our college applications and everything. And then some people, after you get admission, after you're done with your 12th, they also write APs. As I said, 
if you're writing APs after you are done with grade 12, you're purely writing it for credit purpose. So the idea here is just to get more credit and save money, right? So we just need to be clear in terms of why we are doing what we are doing. That's pretty much right. And then obviously the college starts. So this is how the standard timeline look like. Uh, happy to you know discuss with each one of you guys individually, personally, one on one, um, and and see what would be the right timeline for your child uh, if if that helps, right? Okay, I've, we have added just one slide, which is important because you know a lot of people say that you know uh, so with SAT, I mean, does it help in any of the Indian colleges? Yes, so there are a lot of Indian colleges which have started accepting SAT scores, and this is a list of few of them. Ashoka, Prem, Ashoka University, Azim Premji, Flame, Kriya, Manav Rashna, Plaksha, Swim Nadar, you know, few of the top universities in the private, few of the top private universities, uh, uh, in, in especially, uh, you know, in the liberal arts side, actually accept SAT scores, right? So, so it becomes really, really important for these universities as well. Apart from that, there are more than 20, 30 universities now, which are add, added in over the last one year. So you could probably go to this, particular link at national.colgivo.org slash students slash SAT acceptance India and talk about all the list of Indian colleges, which is updating almost on pretty much on a weekly, monthly basis. So yes, even if you, towards the end, you decide not to go to US, you can still your, use your SAT score towards these exams. Great, so with that, we have covered everything about these exams, about the SAT, ACTs and APs. Uh, I will take another two, three minutes to quickly talk about how we kind of prepare uh, students for SAT, ACT. Uh, we don't have enough time, so we would not, we'll skip the AP, but I'll quickly walk you through the pedagogy. The pedagogy still remains the same. We divide the program into four components. We call them phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase zero is about doing a diagnostic test. That's the starting phase, uh, which is for SAT and ACT, just to figure out where the child is better at. And, and also for the child to understand what these tests are all about, right? What kind of question can he expect? That's in phase zero. Once that gets over, you move to phase one, right? Uh, phase one is where the student is learning the concepts, right? There is roughly about 40 to 50 hours of classes, uh, wherein we will be covering reading, writing, and the maths component or the science component. Every session that they do, they will have equal amount of assignments. So if they're doing a two hour class, they'll have two hours of assignment that they need to work on. Uh, if you're doing a session in group, we have both the option groups and one-on-one, -on -one, then every session is done for two and a half hours. That means you have two and a half hours of assignment after every class that you need to do. Uh, there's a tracking mechanism for each and every assignment that you do, uh, which is a score tracker. So you have to update your scores on the score tracker, which help us in our further phases. Uh, once these classes are done, you move to phase two, wherein we assign a dedicated mentor to every student. Uh, this mentor will look at your scores from the phase one, basically the score tracker. And based on that, they will help the child to make a customized study plan for every individual. And this activity will happen almost once in a week or once in every 10 days, wherein they will look at the scores, figure out the areas of improvement, tell them what they need to do to improve it, and then meet again next week to look at what all has been achieved and what they still need to work with. So it's a customized study plan, which is given uh, to the student in phase two until they achieve their sectional targets. Once that gets over, you move to phase three, which is now you have done the topics, you have done the section wise test. Now what you're doing is full length mock test, practice test. So you try and simulate the same exam environment. You'll be doing at least 15 to 20 mock tests. Every test that you write, you get a detailed report analysis saying what areas you've done well, what areas you need to improve. So all of that would be part of phase three. Your mentor support will continue during this time. The mentor will continue to meet you after a couple of tests see where you are going wrong, what needs to be done. And accordingly, they will be helping you out with your prep. So that's how the program works. The program will continue until the student writes the exam. Uh, it's completely customizable. Uh, you know, there are students who will come and do it in the three months period, six month period, one year period. So it all depends on what student really want to do and uh, at what point they want to do. So we work backwards. So we obviously will have the first step is to plan uh, when they will be writing the exam and then you know, work backwards and decide what is the, you know, the intensity of the program should be for the child. We have various modules. Uh, diagnostic test is free of course. Anybody and everyone can write it. Uh, you know, even after this webinar, we're gonna send a link to all the attendees and all the people who are at least registered who could not attend also, wherein the student can go ahead and write the exam, 
it's a digital exam you'll get a report right then and there itself you know if you need we can walk you through the report one on one we can do a free consultation session where in what we can walk you through the report and help you understand more from that report what does that report means that's one part second is an sct st light so uh, that's nothing but wherein you are doing 10 tests so we provide you mock tests right so let's say if you're prepared on your own you're all ready you just need help with tests you just need material and you just need a uh, simulated exam environment so people come to us and they take these tests the proctest test they get a detailed report you know you get feedback after each test uh then there is study plan and full training full training is what i've just explained to you study plan is when a student comes and say you know i probably don't need the faculty ask i i'm i'm good at it you know some of the kids are actually very driven for them what they need is just some guidance so they opt for phase 2 and phase 3 where they just need help with the mentor support and our material uh and our concept videos so we will provide them all of that in the sct st study plan so you know if you look at it there's a lot of customization options available because we uh, you know we believe that the, the one thing which is less here is time right i mean students have pretty less time in terms of uh, and they have a lot of other things to take care of so they should be taking up the program you know which would help them in the long run so yeah, these are the modules uh, that we have at this point of time uh, here are the two numbers uh, that you can give us a call after the webinar if you need any question if you have any other doubt with this uh, i i'm done with this presentation and let me open the forum for q and a's so uh, let me first start taking up questions from the chat section i see there are a few questions already in place uh, so let me start taking up questions there uh, feel free to put in your questions in the uh, chat section guys uh, it will be really helpful and i can take all the questions from there okay the first question that i have is ringu from ringu uh, many industries have stopped considering sat from this year is that true if yes then what is considered in place of sat so ringu that's the exact point uh, you know this confusion this misinterpretation of information is what i am trying to you know clear the air right there are no new colleges which are going test blind please consider two things i will repeat myself which i have did right in the beginning there are two things test blind and test optional right all the ucs for the last 5 years have been test blind they don't look at your sat scores right that's it apart from that there is no other college rest all colleges are test optional right that's because of the pandemic but if you look at the last two year data the data clearly showcase the students who have done the sat have much 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 better chance of getting into the uh, colleges as compared to the other students who have not so there is nothing which is considered in place of sat it's the sat which is considered in place of sat right so so as of today the importance of sat is still there uh, that's what the data suggest uh, so i would recommend to please look at it very seriously uh, can student deciding us as visa dependents or gc holders take visa and msqt uh, yes they can they can uh, take an msqt they are definitely eligible for an msqt uh, from when will these changes happen in sat march 2023 for international candidate march 2024 for us candidate candidates who are staying or residing in us so i hope that i answered your question uh, mr devaria uh, i have another question here from mr rinku please share the link to register for ap exam from which grade onwards one gets eligible to appear for ap on which basis should one decide which subject ap to appear for great question uh, rinku right so uh, link for registering the ap is pretty straightforward it's on the college board website so you go to college board and say ap you will find it right because it's the same organization which is conducting the ap exam so i think i hope that i answered that question uh, which grade you are eligible so the scores are valid for 5 years you are actually eligible from grade 9 to onwards Uh, so nine, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. These are the four years that you get to write your APs. On which basis should one decide which subject AP to appear for? Now that's an interesting question, right? You know, it all depends on you're in which grade. The I mean, the child is in which grade, and what subject are they doing in school? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Let me take an example, right? And uh, so, for example, if the child is in grade nine, and and this is a very interesting conversation. You know, uh, we have one of our uh, 
parent and i had this very same conversation with her almost for a month right before we decided what is the right subject for that child right uh so you know when you are in grade 9 you want to pick up subjects which are slightly easier easier to grasp and wherein student has some sort of understanding right so some kids do let's say coding um early uh, early in grade 7 8 9th right so if they already have some background maybe ap computer science is a good course to look at ap microeconomics is could be a, a a course to look at because it's generally considered to be an easy one so these are few uh, tests uh, sorry few subjects that you could look at when you are in grade 9 when you get to or grade 9th or grade 10 when you get to grade 11th obviously calculus statistics physics chemistry bio all of that will come up now depending on what major you want to do what college you want to apply you can decide on that we generally we had done a ap webinar if you go to our youtube channel you will see a ap webinar there which we did which was just talking about ap and you know we we have shared couple of important links there on that webinar uh, which talks about uh, basically if in case you want to figure out which college accept what ap is you can go there and figure that out right so i hope that should help you go um next question i do also have classes of psat karupriya so karupriya we generally don't recommend anybody to sign up for any course for psat you know it's a practice sat doesn't really make sense right so we prepare students for sat when they are preparing for sat they automatically get prepared for psat right so that's the philosophy that we follow we don't uh, sign up anybody for psat separately we sign them up for together for both psat and sat uh then we have another question uh can you explain the adaptive nature of the new sat format again uh right chetan so unfortunately you know uh, we don't have too much information as well whatever we could understood is it's going to be a section wise adaptive test right um i if you guys know gre gmat right so gre is a section wise adaptive test what happens is you'll get the first section right based on your performance in the first section the system will generate a new section for you now the second section that comes up would be different for different students right the set of questions would be different if let's say i have done let's say if there are 20 question and i have done 18 correct so they will obviously throw a slightly different difficult set to me as compared to someone who got only 10 correct out of 20 this system will throw a slightly easier questions uh, to this student right uh, the next uh, section is going to be slightly easier right because they are trying to benchmark these students based on different score lines so that's how this uh adaptive nature of the sat format works i uh, i hope that answers the question um next i should one take the sat or st or both uh i would say only one not both we have had students who have taken both but ideally if you can figure out which is the best suited test i mean if you're taking both that means you did not do the right you have not followed the right process in the beginning right hence you had to get into that situation if you follow the right process of figuring out the right test for the child right in the beginning uh you should be able to figure out one and you know you'll have to just do one if not then you'll have to be probably doing both just to better off your scores in both but both are it's not mandated to both and it will not help you can't submit both scores any which way next question i have if i want to become a doctor what test should i take now well, it doesn't matter at all what whatever degree you would like to pursue in us uh for any college you'll have to write the sat it's same exam the exam doesn't change with respect to whatever you would like to do, right the journey is different because in us you don't do a doctor directly there is a you know there's a pre med that you do and then you get into the medical so the journey is different you should discuss with your counselors to understand how that journey looks like the pre med first and then medicine it's not directly medicine in us uh next question from where do you get ap study material uh as in uh, okay so we have our own material like we have our own material that we give out to our students who sign up with us uh for you to find out there are various books uh, all these standard publishing house right the baran the princetons of the world they all publish their books on these ap subjects uh tata magro hell they all publish their books on ap subjects if you are actually registered on the college board website uh they generally have a youtube channel for each subject wherein they also do video lessons uh for to help out every student for aps you could also look at that if you want to though they are very basic but i mean it will still help right uh, but yes that's a big challenge that's a big challenge of collecting all that study material and everything and that's where you know organization like us comes into play where you know we can help people to understand uh about the program and 
you know uh, how they can study and you know give them a structured approach per se great i think uh Shad, uh, if you can send the feedback form uh, link on the chat, right? It'll be helpful. So, uh, guys, if you can please sure, put sure. in more questions, I, I have taken up all the questions that are there so far. Uh, we're just sharing a very small feedback form, uh, just for our help. Uh, we would request you to please take maybe one minute of your time uh, and fill that form. Uh, just, and, and it's all anonymous. We don't need a name or anything there. We just want to understand what we could do better to improve and if there's something else you would want to know from us. Uh, after the webinar uh, today, you will get a mail uh, wherein we would be sharing the link with you for the recording. So you will get that. Uh, we'll also be sharing a free consultation uh, link and also the STHT diagnostic testing. So if in case student wants to write the diagnostic test, or they want to go back and look at this webinar again, you want to share it with somebody, feel free to do that. Uh, if somebody wants to do a test, they can do that. Uh, if you want to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with us, uh, you could do that as well, and we'll be more than happy to walk you through that. Um, yeah, any, any further questions uh, that I can answer? I, I think I've taken all the questions here. If there's something that I've missed, please let me know. Okay, I got one question here. Great question. Uh, will there be any change in the validity of SAT scores before the new format versus after the new format? Uh, no, there are no ch changes at all. Uh, you know, there will always be these, this set of student who would have old SAT score versus new SAT scores. Uh, so they, until, you know, that completely phases out, they will have to accept both. If this is a very similar situation which happened in 2015. So before 2015, uh, until 2014, SAT used to be out of 2400 and not out of 1600. So it's 800, 800. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, there were uh, three sections reading, writing, and math, and all of them were out of 800. And it used to be out of 2400. So 2000, until 2014, but in 2015 admission, they had to consider the test scores for 2015 as well, which is out of 1600. And before that, which were out of 2400. So they kind of consider it the reason why they were able to do it because there's a percentile that they also announced, right? So it's not just the score. You also get a percentile, which is really, really important, right? So, so it's the percentile, which kind of helps you uh, or the scholars to understand where you stand, irrespective of whether you do SAT, HT, or whether you do a new SAT or an old SAT. It's both the same. So the validity will remain the same. Great. Any any other question uh, from anybody? Sir, can you share the link, please? Uh, yes. Yes. Great. Uh, okay, I think these are all the questions uh, we have. I think the, the form is here. If you can just take one minute of your time and fill this form, it'll be really, really helpful. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to thank you guys for coming in and attending the webinar. Uh, thanks for joining in. I hope uh, this webinar was useful. And I think we have made your one hour worth the time that you have spent here. I see almost everybody stayed throughout the webinar. So I'm hoping that you guys have gotten some valuable information. Please feel free to reach out to us at any point of time. Uh, as I said, this is a standard timelines uh, that I've showcased to you, but you know, uh, you still need, uh, Sharad, uh, I think you need to give the permission to submit the form. Yes, uh, yeah. right. So if in case uh, you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our numbers are mentioned here. Uh, this is Sharad Sanjudita's number from my team. They can take up the call and they can also connect with me uh, directly as well. Uh, so I think that will be helpful. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks, Ringo. Thanks for the feedback.
i'll stop the recording with this